Eric, my friend, my brother, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's been about over a decade, but hey, we got you here now. What, what's really cool is we're both still doing the same thing. We're still driving the same direction. Got the, you know, we've picked up a lot of information along the way, but we're doing the same thing we were doing back in like, I guess, yeah, 2013 or 14 when we did that first one. But thank yeah, you. it was awesome, man. <laughs> I, for those that don't know, I had Eric on the show early on. So go back and uh, I'll put a link to it anyway. But go back and listen to to that show and then listen to this one as well. But oh man, since that time, you've skyrocketed with the uh, foundation training, which I'm so happy for that and your success because you're helping so many people in the world that need it. I appreciate that. We've had a we've had a pretty amazing run. We were just beginning our certification course when I spoke with you last. Like we had just kind of started getting into the education a bit better. I have a hundred percent thanks to our community. We have 1300, between 1300 and 1400 instructors around the world that have come wow. to our certification course. That's our growth. Like in the last decade, it has been this word of mouth results oriented, constantly evolving practice that is foundation training. And I can't, I'm so happy. I, I can, I can, I was about to say, I can't believe what's happened. I can completely believe what happened. You know, I've, I've been watching the people that have started surrounding this for years. And thanks to them, they have really floated this whole idea and theory and organization and given me and some other people some incredible, incredible opportunities to show a new kind of work to medical professions and physical therapy professions and dental organizations. And I'm very proud and very thankful for where foundation training is, but I really look forward to where we're going in the next 50 mm. years. You know, it's a long endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's well-deserved and you do have a really wonderful community, you know, the support that you have and uh, the love that everybody has for foundation. Every time I've come across somebody who's familiar with that or taken that, it, that's definitely the feeling that comes across. And before we begin, everybody, I'm going to take just a moment to give a heartfelt thank you to Eric and share a little bit of the, the, the story that's been happening in my own personal life with my son, Adam, who's uh, my youngest son and his injury. He suffered a pretty significant and severe disc herniations in his uh, lumbar spine that kind of, kind of seemingly hit out of nowhere, but we know better, right? And um, he was in a world of hurt, and I knew that I needed somebody to to help me help him, because it was just it was beyond me at that point. And I reached out to Eric, and thank you so much. You got back to me really quick, and you've been working with him directly with the foundation training for his uh, low back pain and radicular pain down his left left leg. And I have to tell you, it's been absolutely just incredible to see the changes that he's experienced in just a short period of time with you. And you were always so um, truthful, helpful, but optimistic with him. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'll tell you what, but being there with him, it, it was pretty amazing for me to see just how some of these uh, foundational movements that he was doing were, uh, what can I say? like really challenging for him to do, even though it seemed like he really do wasn't doing that much. But that that was the takeaway of also how much of a change he noticed rather quickly. So first of all, thank you so much for doing that and helping him. It is such a, it's such an absolute pleasure. It's like exactly what my work was made for is that kind of opportunity. And I come with a personality that likes to be really giving. It's how I feel good about myself. So thank you also for the opportunity because that's how I grow. You know, that's how I learn about my work. Adam's a, Adam's a tough case, as you know. That's I mean, thank you for like including me. How cool is that? You yeah. know, for people, oh, this is most professions are are competitive, and it's really silly to be competitive in the in the health field. It's we're all our our. I've said this on so many discussions and in all my courses. Our competitor is in no way, shape, or form. It's, it's not each other. It's Advil and surgeries and unnecessary uh, uh, epidurals and different things like that that change the chemistry of the body and very often the trajectory of chronic pain. Whereas what we can offer is sort of a strengthening and, and I'm optimistic because what happens when you go through that 
autonomous type, I can do this myself, I can get better, better, better process, is the quality of life gets better in all directions. You get confidence built in. You take that, this is happening to me type idea, and you say, oh, this is happening to me, but with it, I'm gonna improve. I don't know, I, I, I get, I don't wanna be on that like, I'm not a motivational speaker. I have no interest in being that. I love watching people understand their body really well. And it's really cool watching rotational changes mm. take hold in the body, which is, which is very often kind of looked past in treatment. Yeah, I, has- I would really like to go down that because that was, that was, here's something that I knew with my son's injury. I knew that a typical approach to you know, low back pain exercises were not going to be something that he needed because He'd been doing a lot of those types of things and he'd been training in the gym for a long period of time. But I I knew that to have that kind of thing show up in a 22 year old in the lumbar spine, he's been missing something for a while. And mm-hmm. when, as soon as he started to b- talk about that rotational component, I mean, I-, I would like to explore that of what you mean by that and, and how, how that component is missing so much in the way we look at rehabilitation. I will, I'll do my best. Uh, I'll do my best. The first thing I can say is the idea of proximal stability yielding distal range of motion is, is articulate as it's been put. So I think McGill, somebody, somebody says that Hmm. and it's true. If the center, the proximal regions are where they're meant to be and are muscularly held and supported there, Very, very often, our center of gravity, the most proximal part of our body, the center, where everything else sort of moves away from, that pubic symphysis, the region right between the two halves of the pelvis that meet, that's our center of gravity, and and we kind of have all these pulleys that keep it at center. Very, very often, we look at that center as like a tuck your hips forward or pull your hips backward or pull under or push under, and and that's not how it works. The Mm. center is two hemispheres that move a lot more like this than like this. And those two hemispheres are guided. So the hip, this is a hard one, the hip articulates into the pelvic wing. This is the femur going into the pelvic wing. Very often, gravity will kind of make us just rest in this external rotation pattern. Like we're just, like we're still seated. We're just resting under And somebody will say, oh, you've got posterior or anterior pelvic tilt. You've got to go the opposite direction. No, you don't. Hmm. You have to learn to pull away from center. And the first pull, at least the first pull of the hips, is 99% of the time. There is a 1%. 99% of the time, it is having to eccentrically load the glute more accurately, which is a muscular internal circumduction. Hmm. The femur head has to leverage itself deeper into the hip socket. When it does that, the glutes that are chronically tight in the 99% are relaxed actively, not passively. The adductor muscles, the sartorius muscle, the gracilis muscle, those muscles take hold in their inward, upward spiraling, that tug of wars the glute and other external rotators. At first, it hurts. Remember Adam's cramping? Yeah, right. Yeah. How sure cool do. is that? Yeah. How cool is that though? Because it's a lever that you have an on and off switch for that he, as he's very quickly learning. That cramping sensation is the tensor fascia, the 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 front diamond-like edge of the iliotibial band, the IT band. That tensor is learning to tense. And that cramp at the front of the hip that most people get learning this work never becomes a Charlie horse. It's just like a tensioning that it's learning. And you can stay in it and breathe through it and then it subsides. And then you hit it again and it's a little less and you hit it again and it's a little less. And eventually the tension of the inner upper adductor, sartorius, gracilis, towards each pubic symphysis. This is a high level talk, I'm sorry, everybody. Um, towards each side of the center of gravity, those tethers take hold. And the only thing the glute can do is relax and lengthen, Hmm. which allows the strong powerhouse propulsion muscles, the glutes, 
to propel. What they can't do, I'm gonna lower this just for a second to show you this. What you don't wanna have happen is you don't want your butt muscle to always be squeezing in, turning your hips outwards away from center like this. It hurts, it hurts a lot. And it takes the center line of the leg, the, the groin muscles, the adductor, and it turns muscles like those out away from center, which changes the contraction pattern of all of the proximal muscles and makes the statement proximal stability yields distal uh, coordination or range of motion, it makes it wrong because the proximal center is off and everything else is trying to operate off kilter. So what we do with foundation training, when I say rotational changes, what I mean is very many of our poses have this internal rotation where the outside edges of the heels are turned in and there's corkscrewing of the back of the leg to open the glutes, to open the facets, to open the SI joint that is very chronically compressed hmm. forwards. And in a case like Adam, very tall, very strong, growing, that compression through all of his weight and force through his bottom two lumbar vertebrae. And the result is significant herniation because where can that force go? It's not made for that. The hips are made for that. The glutes are made for that. The adductors, the hamstrings, the big muscles. And when those muscles line up accurately, we train hip hinging, we train some sort of lateral motions with it. We train the cross body patterns, different things like that. And all of the sudden, you have neurologically repatterned rotational movements. Mm. And with it comes counterbalance. And with counterbalance comes pain relief. And that's kind of the pathway. Rotational improvement, creating length. At least we talked about the hips. We haven't talked about the shoulders and neck yet. But from the, from the center of gravity outward, those inward rotations that look awkward and feel hard, even though it looks like you're not doing much, are incredibly corrected. Yeah, oh, oh, I'll say that for sure. For a couple of things, it's like one because Adam told me he said I I really hate turning my hips in like that because <laughs> it was it was challenging for him, you know. And he would start to cramp up and stuff like that. And he's like, "Geez, I don't know. I don't really want to be there." I'm like, "Well, that means you need to be there." So that was a yeah. lot of feedback for him. Uh, to get that one. And one of the biggest things for me is, uh, cause Hey, you know, we're always learning. We're forever a student. Right. And then of course when people think of, um, you know, proximal stability or back pain, they automatically think of like the core abdominal, uh, bracing. So it's about the brace, brace, brace. I'll be honest with you, Eric. I, I never once had my brain go to the pubic synthesis at all. And as soon as you said it, I'm like, well, that makes all the sense in the world because he was having such an issue with dissociating his pelvic um, uh, pelvic stability for him with his ilium on either side. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I was just doing the stuff higher up. But you said also to be careful not to overbrace. Well, I love right. bracing, I love abdominal bracing. I, I, I've actually pushed many, many people to DNS and to different. No. So uh, yeah, we're talking about how I got, uh, you, you focused in on the, the pubic synthesis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which honestly wasn't on my radar at all. And now it makes total sense. And I was, I was going more up top mm -hmm. for the, the, uh, abdominal, uh, bracing for him. With his, Absolutely. Uh, and it's, it's logical. And look, I, I went through chiropractic school and I went through a personal training certification at 18 and was learning all about the muscles and learned all about the abdomen. And I learned all about the glutes and I learned about the quads and the calves. And, and every now and then I'd hear this word serratus. And every now and then I'd hear this word adductor. Every now and then I'd hear this term, especially once I got to chiropractic school because of uh, uh, sacral nerve referral issues, I heard about the tibialis anterior. When I started having major back pain, I was lucky enough to feel very weak in a lot of those areas, mm. even though I was training hard. I did not discover that the pubic synthesis is the center of gravity. I didn't discover that the abdomen gets too tight and crunches might shorten 
uh, a lumbar extension or flexion issue and make it worse. I didn't discover any of that. I felt my way through what was happening in my body for many, 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 many years, every single day, constantly. And then all of a sudden, my first and best exercise by far is not the founder. The founder is the first exercise that got me out of pain, but the one that makes the most sense is called the adductor assisted back extension. And this is the one that taught me all about the pubic symphysis because I was completely unable to extend my spine on the floor without hurting and especially without hurting the next day. And then what I started doing is bringing my knees together, squeezing my knees the whole time and then rolling out my heels, which was a forced, relatively aggressive internal rotation. I didn't really know what I was doing yet. What I knew is I could do it mm. and it felt better. And all of a sudden there was two points on my body I could extend that I couldn't before. And now I couldn't have my knees bent 90 degrees. My knees were bent like that in these exercises. Long lever because you want the assistance of the medial and lateral hamstring for stability. And then you want the adductor playing tug of war with those. So the knees are rolling in together. Imagine you're closing a scroll. That's what the knees are doing and the femurs are doing. They're closing inward together. As I was able to, on my belly, lift my head and my back up into extension, not only not hurting, but feeling an incredible range of motion that I just didn't have. And it came from the downward contraction of the muscles connected to the pubic symphysis. Because when they would anchor in, which I now call the anchor line, when those muscles would anchor my pelvis, my pelvis wouldn't try to move towards the spine when I would extend. It would instead hold as things lengthened. And as I got stronger in the adductors, I could feel a distinct, clear separation of my injury sites. The stronger my legs got, the better my back got, but not because I was, you know, squatting, doing things like this, because I was learning to elongate and widen my serratus muscles so they would better contract my diaphragm. And I was learning that my abdomen was too short. I was spending too much time being strong there, and it was minimizing my lower back strength my glute strength, my all of the real core muscles. In fact, I wrote a book in 2011 that was Redefine the Core. It's called Foundation. Redefine your core to conquer back pain. And the redefinition was about four inches lower to the pubic symphysis. There's an exercise called the adductor assisted back extension. There's exercises like the founder and the woodpecker. They're very linear still. At that point, I understood rotation at the hips, but not at the rib cage yet. This was 2011, 2010, 2009, very early. When I started to really understand the abdomen truly was when I started to understand the transverse abdominis better. The reason the pubic symphysis must be held at center has to do with the ability. Stay with me. Take a deep breath if everybody needs to. We're doing a lot right now. Mm -hmm. But. It has to, I know you know this, Perry, but I mean, for everybody listening, the, the transverse abdominus is not a corset that you tie up, okay? It's a tension line that pulls apart the floating ribs and sort of pulls them out and away from the adrenal glands, from the kidneys. Remember, our torso is protective. The muscles are meant to be protective, like a shield in all directions. The back of the ribs tend to go like this in a lot of people. Yeah. And the chest pushes forward. And then the shoulders drop forward and the neck, but I can't even do it anymore. The neck pulls forward and you get these awkward S-like and C-like and J-like and all different kinds of letters. The closest one is probably the S. But really the closest would be more like a question mark, which I think Esther Gokhale talks about in a nice way. I think some other people have talked about it because it's, a, it's not really a question mark. It's like, it's like a tail, like a dragon tail that you're pulling down while the dragon's trying to fly away. You know, there's a downward pull 
at the sacrum diamond and the coccygeal diamond. And there's also an upward pull at the occiput and the uh, external occipital protuberance. Okay, so when we pull the head apart from the body, especially here, and we pull down the sacrum, we get a longer spine. Great. Nowhere near enough. Nowhere near enough. And this is where things started to get so interesting. It was about 2013, 14, 15, 16, that this started to really make sense. When you pull apart the floating ribs, it cascades the thoracic rib cage. Not this way, but this way. It, it fills the room behind you. It gives lung volume to the back edges of the lungs. In order to do that, you have to have something to pull the floating ribs away from. They're not just gonna arbitrarily do that. That's where I learned about the pubic synthesis, anchoring, the abdomen. I mean, I'm talking, Perry, if I could have been on LSD, it would have been better. It was <laughs> such a strong, ridiculous connection. It was like all of the sudden, the inward pull to keep the pubic synthesis down was anchoring not only the occipital pull, but also that boom, pull apart mm. of the thoracic spine. And with width of the back ribs comes decompression of the spine. So my work is now very largely catered on, like we've talked about, lifting the back skull, lifting the shoulder blades apart and filling the space between without dropping the sternum. That's decompression breathing against pelvic anchoring. And that's foundation training. It's a long, winded, very long description, but that's that's probably as much as I can shorten it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you have two books that people need to, to go get and certification courses and lots of videos on YouTube and an app and all those things, which your app is awesome, man. Thank uh, you. The videos on there and the guidance from yourself and your instructors in there. And I believe uh, Jesse's in there quite a lot, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, he's in there yeah. a ton. Yeah, yeah. So you got a lot of great instructions for for people to go, and um, thank you. There's there's a lot I want to circle back on. One of them Please. was, um, you know, you, when you get zeroed in on back pain, you start looking at the back. And I'll be honest with you, when when I when my son was hurt, I felt I fell into the trap of just looking at where his pain was, even though my business is called Stop Chasing Pain, because it's so easy to do when you're hurt and you're emotional and you're just you, you don't you're not quite sure what to do. And uh you know, that's when somebody says, Well, you know, your your tibialis anterior is probably gonna be something that's linked to the uh low back, which which his was uh mm -hmm. for him. Uh, Cause I want to go and cycle back on some of these mm -hmm. areas. Can, can you chat a little bit about well, what that tibialis anterior is and why that is playing such a significant role overall and even more so mm -hmm. like why it's helpful for somebody of what my son had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the tibialis anterior is the front shin muscle. Um, it, it goes. Oh, hang on. From right about here, it's this meaty bone or meaty muscle right here. And it kind of has a really interesting insertion because it goes into the foot and it hooks underneath the big toe at the joint. So the way that you lengthen the tibialis anterior is pointing your foot away from you as far as possible. Mm -hmm. And the way that you shorten the tibialis anterior is pulling your foot toward you as tight as possible. Great. What happens in most people that wear shoes, boots, work at desks, commute all the time, drive cars all the time, is very often one or the other or both tibialis anteriors become adaptively lengthened. Everybody in PT knows what adaptively shortened is. Nobody talks about adaptively lengthened, and that's what happens to the other stuff, hmm. the other side. So in most, I'm, I'm probably going to say the 99% again, because and almost everybody I see, this is a real discrepancy. Maybe a, maybe a, a 90% or an 80% of people tend to have a heel that likes to ride about an inch higher than the balls of the toes. Um, that's wrong. It's not how it's supposed to be. It keeps the tib anterior really long. It keeps the back of the leg, the, the posterior tibialis, the tug of war mechanism. It keeps it shorter 
adaptively shortened. That relationship is not isolated to the ankle, the toes, the shins. When the tib anterior is too long, or we could say the tib posterior is too short, whichever makes more sense, we have to strengthen it because it's the key lever to the posterior chain. Literally the whole backside of the body is tension by dorsiflexion of the ankle. Mm -hmm. And you can do it passive. You can go stretch your foot on a curb. You can do things like that to stretch the calf. But without the strength of the tib anterior tightening, you don't get the strength of the posterior chain integrating. And foundation training is based on posterior chain integration, meaning the glutes, the hamstrings, the calf muscles, the posterior tib, the, the lats, the lower back musculature, they're all working in concert to both lengthen and support the spine and keep central the hip joints. So without a tib anterior strength that is capable of keeping you at neutral instead of plantar flexed when you're neutral, it's very hard to heal. You don't have the muscular support of the large muscles of the posterior chain protecting the spine. So you start to count on the, the multifidi, the transversera, the extensor muscles, which are crappy. They're, they're tiny. They're tiny. You know, you, you don't, it's just not, it's like running a, running a sprint in flip-flops. They don't have the tension that you need around your foot at that moment. You're better off to be barefoot. So you want big muscles doing big work and small muscles reacting. So something I teach a lot more than, more than probably anybody is when you hinge it's not just a hip motion mm. there is like a lengthening that occurs throughout all different areas in the body that control that motion and you've got to really learn all of them because your body doesn't work in one direction it works in all these different planes the pelvis does nothing more than guides the torso of where to go it's like a platform that you want to be with you, not against you. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Kitty Alice strengthens that. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And um, I want to work up towards uh, the occiput, back of the back of the yeah. head, and, and uh, chin in there too. But before I get to there, because now that you mentioned uh, not just hinging at the hips, which I mean, people just discovering what a hinge is is kind of a big deal, right? Um, but that there's so much more to it. And like you said before, I mean, you teach a hinge on like anything I've ever seen before. Is that one of the things that really helped Adam a lot was you were trying to tell him to find these three points on his feet. Yes. Can you can you discuss that a little bit before we go all the way up to the other end? Let me uh let me take people. I want everybody to be able to see this. This is what? there we go. Yeah. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. So See how I'm lifting my toes right now? Yeah. I'm not lifting my foot. I'm lifting my toes. One of the best ways to make sure that the dorsiflexion muscle, the tip anterior, is strengthening is by lifting and spreading the toes. What I'm doing is it's like I'm standing on a tripod on each foot. And the three points on each foot are moving away from each other. So my right heel, my right big toe joint, my right small toe joint, like I'm making a shaka sign with my foot. Same on the left, left heel, left big toe, left small toe joint. They're moving away from each other like a triangle trying to get broader, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, what that does is each one of those has a stimulation, an activation of musculature, like a lot, a lot of musculature, <laughs> a really surprising amount, something I can't get people to understand enough the importance of. And, and how many muscles are involved through the foot and how often our foot does this. Yeah. And that's where you live. Imagine having hands that never went to grip for something. Great the example. Foot, yeah. Yeah. The foot operates a lot like a hand, especially in nature, but obviously not with quite the dexterity, but a lot of strength it needs some dexterity. The big toe joint is this medial line that travels up the pes answer in that point and the medial knee, and it contracts those pes answering based muscles because what it does is it tightens the posterior tibialis. Mm. And in tightening that, it pulls the knee medially, ever so subtly. And then it tightens the soleus and the gastroc and it turns it just a little more in that direction, which makes the tib anterior and the, and the peroneus have to contract. 
So now we have a reciprocal activation. By pressing the big toe into the ground and pressing the small toe into the ground, we're getting two muscle chains to communicate all the way up to the hip. By planting the heel, imagine a raptor, like it's like plant the heel, push the feet to grab. By planting that heel, we get the posterior chain to grab, the glutes, the hamstrings. We don't want any of those to dominate. We want them all moving eccentrically. We do not want our body to be really good at shortening its muscles. We want our body to be really good at absorbing force as the muscles absorb it and lengthen. So those three points are force activators up the leg, big toe joint, small toe joint, heel, move them away from each other. Don't move them toward each other. The folks trying to fix plantar fasciitis with these movements, please stop. You're making it work. You need length through the whole chain, not a slightly stronger arch, I promise. And that's the type of thing that I've kind of been able to, I guess, realize through patient encounters over many years now and many, many, many patient encounters that I've just correlated a thousand times that big toe joint doing this, that small toe joint doing this, that heel doing this. And without them, as the foot rolls up or rolls out, you lose tensegrity, a very popular term you lose the ability of the body to be held muscularly instead of resting into joints. Yes. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And love the demo too. So yeah, make sure everybody you. You check out the video version of this on uh, YouTube, by the way. Okay. And um, now let's go, we're going to work our way back towards the middle on those thoracic. Cause I mean, that's <laughs> a big deal. And I know you're excited about those and most people don't have any awareness of their thoracics. And rib it's wild. Pain. It's yeah, wild. isn't that crazy? Well, I, I was guilty of it too. Um, mm -hmm. So let's move up near the top where if if I take a look around at the average posture that most humans have today, you know, the, the head is really far forward. There's a lot mm -hmm. of pressure on the back and, and they're slumped and rounded forward. They're they're losing things up. But yeah, that's it. That's, that's the look, right? Of how critical it is to, to position that head backwards and what it does all the way down the chain that's so a, i was totally blown away dude about how much i could feel because you used the word decompress when i did that i was like holy cow i could actually feel my whole spine decompress a little bit when i did that it's a lovely feeling it's a very difficult claim to make and at this stage i am 16 years into my career almost seven to almost 17 years I'm really into my career now and I've, I've made the claim a lot and I'm almost confident making it. Now I know it's true. So don't, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I, I know it's true. I feel it. I've had God, so many patients and friends that, that have done this for many years that understand exactly what I'm saying. When I say foundation training decompresses the torso, it doesn't spot perfectly decompress that one injury you have. It teaches your torso to share the volume and mass of itself, hmm. instead of allowing focal point pressures to, to dive in as they tend to. The second, I mean, the millimeter above the pubic symphysis. So, and that's about S, maybe like S two or three, I think on most people, mm -hmm. the, the, the same level as the pubic symphysis. So the minute you're about halfway up the sacrum, you can no longer decompress that region from below. You can decompress with a little bit of additional rotation inward. You can open up to set joints at the lumbosacral region a little bit, but not a vertical lift. The vertical expansive and, and kind of density increasing decompression has a very important lever like you're talking about. It's taking the curvature of the lumb of the, I'm sorry, the cervical spine, that lumbar, <laughs> that was so confusing a statement. Give me a second. I'm much better with the muscles than the, the, the joint curvatures, it seems. <laughs> it's taking the lordosis of the cervical spine and reinstilling it. As soon as your head goes forward like this, your, your head becomes a straight vector. The curve, when you're, when you're lordotic naturally, your skull is up and behind your shoulder blades. You don't see that often these days. No, but, and it also, it's not, I mean, you're not trying to walk like this. Right. You're trying to have the back of you big and the top of you tall. 
front of you tall. Now, you have a, an incredible, incredible, I mean, the coolest pulley system I have ever seen attached to your occiput. The lever to lift it is the external occipital protuberance that bumps. Everybody watching this can press that pointy bone. Show them on yourself as well, Perry. So just in case they're watching you, you're lifting this occiput. Find the pointy bone and notice that, yeah, you can drop your chin down and it kind of opens, but don't open it, lift it. And if you lift it, you have the opportunity to start engaging the sternocleidomastoid muscle the coolest lever in the whole body. Pretty damn cool. Because most of us haven't quite gotten this bipedal thing down all that well yet. We keep catching gravity instead of resisting gravity. And the sternocleidomastoid muscle resists gravity and it provides like this lift. Now, a lot of people hear that and they say, you shouldn't be dependent on your sternocleidomastoid. That's a bad posture to lift with your neck. You're not lifting with your neck. You're teaching it to work with everything else because it's not working with everything else right now. And it's a lever that can connect both the anterior chain and posterior chain. So everybody that's lifting that external occipital protuberance, either sit or stand with your legs together. That's the easiest hack. Legs together. And then take a deep breath through the big high portion of your nose right here. I mean, I know it's not any real different, but just try to take a deep breath through the highest portion of your nose. So it does this. And you'll notice when you do that, you get this lift. Watch me breathe for a couple breaths. I'm lifting the back of my skull and breathing through my nose. Oh yeah. Now decompression breathing is this. You see how it maintained through the exhale? Mm. Decompression breathing is teaching the eccentric absorption of the SCM, the serratus muscles, and the diaphragm to strengthen in concert together. You cannot do it without that occipital lever. Now, we have some gold standards in pain relief that simply don't take these things into account. And I respect the 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 gatekeepers in our industry, man. I really do. I really do. But they got to let foundation training in because what that can do for people is so remarkable. So Stu McGill, if somehow you see this, bring it in. Let's test it, bro. Let's do this the right way and really try to prove it wrong. It works so well. It's so hard to understand until you do it. But that lever becoming simply a participant in your posture will improve the quality of your life for the rest of it. It has to maintain. You got to keep doing it. You don't do it a few times and then never do it again. Mm -hmm. But you spend a few minutes, five, 10 minutes a day until it becomes part of how you breathe, part of how you stand. When you're lifting weights and you're doing a deadlift, this ain't okay. This is how you connect the dots. There's just integration versus not. And I've done this enough times now and I have instructors that are all different types of doctors and all different types of therapists and practitioners that say the same thing through their patients. You can't get where this gets you without it. That's it. And because of that, I'm really trying to push. I've actually this year started to push again. I would say that I was when we had our, we just had our second daughter a year and a half ago and we had our, our first daughter who's six now. And I just really focused on that a lot. I wasn't pushing, pushing, pushing foundation training in the same way. But in 2024, I have absolutely committed to really driving this thing because we're doing really well. We've got, we've got some opportunities ahead of us. So thank you for, for you know, giving me a little catapult here. I appreciate it. I, I tend to over-explain, so I'm sorry if that was a long one for everybody. No, I mean, I love those. I mean, it, uh, especially the demonstrations that you're going in there. And oh. when I started to, uh, so I had to begin to slowly incorporate that as well because I realized how easy I would fall out of that. Yeah. And it was just, just the awareness, first of all, but I, I began to transition that also to when I was in the gym and training, yes. I could, I could feel that carryover to just my overall stability when I was able to keep that neck packed in, if you will, pull back as opposed to Pack, packed in, but not military neck. Make sure you have plenty of room between your hyoid bone and your mylohyoid. 
you need space there. So when you're doing this, you don't want to be here. This can be very problematic and actually it'll, it'll, you know, people pass out from military neck and you're actually sticking your second vertebra out really far. Mm, okay. But what you want to make sure you're doing is a lift, a lift of the weight of the head off the neck. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But you're doing, I mean, I, I mean, you were doing that, but that's just for everybody. Yeah. That's great. It's a great point. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So let, let's move into, uh, Ben, this is something that I've begun to get into recently uh, on my own in general, which is the, um, the importance of the thoracic spine, thoracic cage. And I thought mm -hmm. it was interesting when I was uh, talking with you about Adam's case, you zero it in a lot because uh, he's really tall. He's six, six, mm -hmm. and he's got a really long torso about how we focus in on that thoracic spine region for him and rib cage region. That's going to have a lot of nice carryover to his lump, to his uh, lumbar spine. So and, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. And I, I, I find it with people that I see them in my office that they really don't have any awareness of how their rib cage is moving or feeling anything in the, the back at all. It, it's just like, uh, no, it was like no man's land back there. <laughs> it, it takes like 50 breaths. I think mm. it takes 50 breaths to become physically aware of that. And you'll never lose it after those breaths, like after, and not in one day, maybe 10 breaths a day where you really drive it home. Cause it's hard to do initially. Um, and, but we did get to watch Adam very quickly, learn how to do it. You know, you yeah. learn that sensory and then all of a sudden it's there. Uh, what you're talking about is the thoracic spine more, the orientation of the rib cage as it directly connects to the thoracic spine. There's a lot of uh, consequence to subtle shifts in the thoracic spine for a couple of reasons. One, heart and lungs are there. But because the heart and lungs are there, there's these other barometric, uh, barometric pressure sensors, the, 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 uh, the sympathetic rami and things like that. The, the nerve endings that stimulate partially our, our sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system, are also lining the posterior rib cage. That's why breathing can affect how we feel so much. When you learn to take those out of a tightened position where we're squeezing the shoulder blades together, where we're breathing into the chest or into the belly, instead of forcefully, slowly, but forcefully, like, like slow water moving something out of the way, not a tidal wave. We're taking an inhale in through the nose, doing everything possible to feel these ribs try to move away from each other. It's very easy to do if you drop your chest, it forces it, but it's not a muscular breath, that's passive pressure. The key is lift up tall, use that occipital lever, all of these things coming together. When your chest is pressed forward, you shrink the surface area of the rib cage significantly. You also make it so that both the intercostalis muscles that move the ribs and the serratus muscles that move the ribs, they got nowhere to go. They got nowhere to go. They're being blocked. So you don't get a complete diaphragm contraction. You don't get a complete rib cage wall expansion unless you focus on relaxing the shoulder widening the lats and breathing into that back expanse of the rib cage. Cool thing is the lungs are a lot bigger back there, a lot bigger. It's one of the first things people tend to get in foundation training after practicing this posterior rib cage expansion is an improved breath via lung volume. Hmm. You're taking up more tissue and it's slow. You can do, what's it called? Um, Constantin Butyko. You can do Butyko breathing slow in through the nose to the back of the ribs. It's not how hard and fast you do it. It's the deliberate sensation that you're finding of rib cage expansion behind you. That fires serratus muscles beautifully. And the serratus muscles are a tethering system. You have two serratus groups behind you and one big serratus group in front of you at the anterior. When you squeeze your shoulder blades together, you detension the entire serratus anterior. It's not, it's like got slack. It's like a loose rope. It can't do anything. 
because that serratus anterior goes from the rib cage through and in kind of grabs the back of the shoulder blade from within. You want those moving away from each other, not towards each other. If you want to be able to take a big breath, engage the serratus and all of a sudden you have this muscular volume of breathing that is new to a lot of people. Endurance athletes tend to have found that. They tend to have found that. So this one's more of like a, that thoracic expansion down there, most cyclist and runner endurance athletes do tend to find that naturally. Um, and mountain climbers and stuff like that, where you're just breathing really heavy, really hard for a long time. It's cool how the body adapts towards it. When the back ribs learn to move like this, it can be very stressful because you're triggering that sympathetic response in, in the ribs. So decompression breathing isn't immediately a calm down type thing. Like I don't try to teach people breathing chemistry. I don't try to teach people breathing timing. I only teach people where a corrective breath should physically go. So how would that be? Because I see a lot of people talking about belly breathing, right? So it's all about going down in the belly. And sometimes they'll cue people to expand the lower lateral margins of the mm -hmm. rib cage, right? Yep. So where does a where does that diap where does that belly diaphragm breathing fit into being able to feel it up in that region? Not mutually exclusive, right? I would consider the right way to breathe as a human being to be the way that you just described, hmm. not decompression breathing in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Our breath practice is to make space for that to occur accurately. I see. Okay. Think about it. Let's change. Let's play with positions for just a second. And anybody watching this or listening, do it with me. So Perry, just let everything kind of settle, but more important, most important, let the hip joints just kind of move away. That's it. Yep. Now take a giant, powerful belly breath, a strong one, the best belly breath you can take in that position. The best one. Another one. Take a couple. Feel it. Really feel it. Sorry if you can hear my baby crying in there, but she'll, okay, Jen's good. She'll, she'll, be good right there. <laughs> she'll be good in a moment. So now, don't just come out of it. Let's do two very important levers. First, knees together. Okay. Heels apart. Yep. Next, base of the skull lifting away from the hips. Mm -hmm. Take the biggest belly breath you can. Feel that muscle? Oh, yeah. Plus, I just feel I could get a lot more. So much more lung volume, so much more breath control. And if what we're looking for is like, you know, work to reward ratio, you're getting a much better reward for a very similar amount of work. Yeah. Yeah. The efficiency is improved. Now, why decompression breathing? Most people can't do what you just did. Most people don't have the postural awareness, the body awareness, the movement capacity to go, oh, I just have to lift my upper torso away from my pelvis. And that gives me a longer, wider, denser abdomen that can accept more lung volume, but really, really can pull the diaphragm away. That's the difference in the breathing mechanisms. Mm. Belly breathing tries to do this with the diaphragm with a vacuum. Like it fills the abdomen to do this. Decompression breathing tries to do the exact same diaphragmatic mechanism. We're trying to take a 360 degree flattening like a trampoline of the diaphragm. In my opinion, the only way to really get that, to really, really get that is to have the serratus muscles secure against each other. So we breathe big up top to get the same space between the hips and pelvis so that once that strength is there and you belly breathe, you belly breathe very accurately. Now, I think everybody should learn DNS. I think everybody should learn how to brace for powerlifting, Olympic lifting or boxing or kickboxing or to get, <clears throat> you know, everybody needs to know that you need to know how to control your body. But if that feeling doesn't feel good, you need to learn decompression breathing first. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense like that? That's yeah. kind of how I see us fitting in. If all you do is decompression breathing, you're going to end up like walking around like this with not very much stability because you haven't pulled back to center. Yeah, that is a great point. It's like everything else. I mean, it's just it's a mixture of a lot of different things that you should mm -hmm. be doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and, and 
you're learning a skill like foundation training is a two you're learning two skills you're learning the skill of anchoring you're learning the skill of decompression and then we've got 30 or so poses that you can put those skills together in. you put those two pulleys together so when somebody comes to your thing for the first time and then that first hour yes. what are the big things that you hammer home in that that first when they when they come to see you we finger trap them we try to pull the head apart and we try to pull the feet wide so we're looking at the three points of contact on each feet, learning to spread the toes, learning to distribute most of your weight through the pads, the perimeter of the arch, not the arch itself. Hmm. Next, we lift away from that. And one of the hardest things for people to learn is to keep the feet engaged as the, the SCM lift and the skull lift and all of that happens. It's a really hard thing for a lot of people to coordinate that. The moment they can coordinate those two, we move into hip hinging. Notice with Adam, we didn't go into hip hinging at all initially. It was, it was, it would aggravate him a little bit because he hadn't quite got that lift off of it yet. Right. And it wasn't really until we actually had you rotating the femur and the leg a little bit that we were able to get a much more neutral, comfortable hip hinge in there. And those rotations and those lifts are so important. And what I, the way I teach those is through the big toe joint, the small toe, allowing these things to move. So if somebody were to go on my streaming app, then they get the fundamentals, which is fundamentals of anchoring, fundamentals of decompression breathing, fundamentals of hip hinging, before they would move into any of our programming or even our protocols. Uh, if somebody goes to an instructor, it should be <laughs> very similar to that. We have a lot of instructors with a lot of backgrounds and everybody's a little different. Although foundation training, if they're certified, certainly is taught the way foundation training is taught. Yeah, well, I love the words that you're using in general, fundamentals. And then mm -hmm. foundational, which is another word for fundamental, to be able to build upon those. That's why I like that so much. I could never have gotten stronger if I hadn't kind of untwisted certain injury patterns in myself. And that's why it's called foundation training, because I had a very personal, a very shaky foundation. And it was injuring me on a regular basis when I was your son's age. You know, my stuff started 19, 20, 21, 22. It wasn't until I was 27 that I started to get out of pain. Adam's going to have a much earlier exit for his pain, luckily. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's, it's a real thing. If you don't learn these fundamentals, you, you, can, you can get really lost in chronic pain, really lost. Um, and this is not a fix-all. This is not a cure-all. This is not going to help everybody every time. But our success rate is very significant. And because of that, I'm pretty confident making these. I, I know they're big statements, um, but I, just, I want people to have pretty optimistic outlooks with this. Yeah, well, you should be. I mean, you definitely help myself and you help my son for sure. So where, where, what's, uh, what's coming up for you and foundation in uh, 2024, my friend? We got good stuff. So we just launched in January. We launched one of my favorite programs we've ever launched, which is our 65 and up program. It can be done by anybody, but it's, it's really catered to people that are trying to regain confidence and stability. And it's a very good program. We just launched it in January. We've gotten very good feedback on that. It's about, like everything we do is available to all of the members in the app. So any new programs or you just get them and you see them. When we released that, I have a very fun patient that I've been working with for, you know, 12, 13, actually 14, 15 years now, Jeff Bridges, who did a really fun workout to help people find the older folks program. And Jeff is 74. He's been doing foundation training since 2010. And he, uh, He's a, he's a walking powerhouse. From, he's very strong. Go watch his video. Just watch the Jeff Bridges session, if anything, to get inspired of what this work can do for you over the years. Um, we have a certification course that you can't sign up for it anymore for people, but it's, it's coming in uh, end of February in San Diego. Very excited to get out there for that. We've got, I've got a great team and we bring the whole team to our courses. It's like a reunion every time we do it, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we have another one coming up in Orlando and then a, a one in Sydney, Australia in May. Uh, so the certification course is something that our team takes super seriously and it's like our highest level of education. Um, those are the biggies, a couple podcasts and stuff coming up. I really, I mean, one of the more fun things I could ever do is work with colleagues like this, like people that I look up to. I've told you and your son a million times, I I've been watching your career. The reason I'm so into lymphatic stuff, the reason I'm so into the idea of the body aquarium, which I never use that term. It's your term, but that thought process is brilliant. And it helps people understand the whole thing, the picture, instead of, as, as, as my mentor, uh, Tim Brown says, he's like, you're either looking at the hole or you're looking at the donut. 
you help people look at the donut. Real <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Tim's awesome. Yeah. Tim's awesome. Tim has taught me. Tim's probably taught me more than anybody in the world, honestly. He's an incredible guy. Incredible human. Really is. Really is. Yeah. Very giving person. Yeah. But I, you know, for people that feel like there's just not something that can help them, just go spend, just try to spend a week or two just trying, trying the fundamentals. Just try Read the comments through the community. Read the comments on the YouTube videos. Like, it's the real thing. There's not that many things that are the real thing, but, you know, this is a Rolls Royce of automobiles when it comes to movement. Yeah. And yeah, everybody, please do that. There's a lot of great information on uh, YouTube. You see Eric on there and you have a, a fun, a, one of your early videos up there too. And there's quite a lot of yeah. comments of people saying, yeah. you know, this, the original this made such a difference for me, you know, and then, so it, it, it's also uh, like anything else changed over the years, improved, tweaked mm -hmm. over the years, things like that as well. And everybody listening, well, of course, we'll put links up. You can click on those pretty easy and then go check those out whenever you like. And Eric, my friend, thank you so much for taking the time out of your life to come on and spend some time with us and all my listeners around the world. It's been great. It's a pleasure, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. You asked, I, I didn't mention one thing that I know that we have coming. That's really cool. So you mentioned Jesse Solis briefly on, and you'll see anybody coming to the app or coming to anything foundation training. will get to know Jesse. Well, he has a strength program coming out on our app relatively soon that combines foundation training into what he does, which is he's a certified strong first certified starting strength certified in cross. He's like done all these certifications over the years when he was a firefighter. And then when we brought him in, seven, eight, eight years ago. Um, he brought a lot of that to us. Now that's not foundation training, but the combination of foundation training preparation with Olympic lifting, power lifting, other different functional movements like that is incredible. So that's one, I think it'll probably be available maybe like Mayish later in the year, maybe summertime, but we're, we're excited about that. And Jesse, he's a uh, extraordinary coach. So good, good to learn from. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much for saying that. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. This is Dr. Perry from Stop Chasing Pain. We'll see you soon on the other side.